Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is James Quillinan. Jim is an attorney and shareholder with Hopkins and Carly in San Jose, where he's the chairman of the Family Wealth and Tax Planning Department. Uh, he has been practicing law since he graduated with his law degree from the University of Santa Clara in 1974. He's highly respected in the legal community. He's a frequent lecturer and author for the State Bar of California and Continuing Education of the Bar. He serves as Special Master and Referee in Santa Clara County and San Mateo County Superior Court in Complex Trust and Probate Matters. Jim loves to go to the movies, and his movie reviews are very popular. You can sign up to receive Q's reviews. <laughs> Uh, uh, by email for free at www.hopkinscarly.com. Today, Jim and I are going to be discussing portability of a deceased spouse's unused exemption amount. That's a mouthful. And its implications for estate and gift planning and when administering estate uh, after a death. And as we get started, this is just an introduction to complex issues to help become aware of them for further discussion uh, with an attorney and or other tax advisor who's familiar with them. The problems we're discussing are complex. There may not even be solutions to them yet. Uh, we do have some nice new regulations that came out from the Internal Revenue Service that we'll be talking about a little bit. But uh, there's going to be litigation on this probably in the future and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we'll be uh, seeing developments happen over the years. Jim, thanks a lot for joining me today. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be here and talk a little bit about what we're, we're calling uh, portability. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's also got another horrible uh, acronym called DSUYA. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, get into that. we'll get into that. But in any <laughs> event, the, uh, uh, the, the, the concept here is that uh, Every person has an, a, an exemption that they can leave to someone other than a spouse and pay no tax on it, which is currently $5,250,000. Five right. And that, that amount is uh, indexed, mm -hmm. and so it's going up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already gone up in, uh, in a, a year and a, couple, and a month from $5 million to $5,250,000. And if you start looking at the application of the, uh, uh, of the indexing, Within a decade, it could be over $10 million. So it's a uh -huh. very significant amount of money. Yes. But one of the things that, that is, was important, it was important uh, two years ago when they did the first tax change, and something people have been talking about a long time, is to allow a spouse, and it only applies to spouses at the moment, is I can give my spouse my exemption. Yes. Uh, so that means if my, my, my wife and I are together worth about $7 million, I can say, honey, you can have everything, it's all yours, plus you have my exemption. So that when she dies, she not only has her $5 million ex exemption, she also has mine. Mm -hmm. So that's a total of 10, she's got seven, there's no tax. We're under the, another, the, the prior scenario, if I didn't do it that way, and I gave her everything, she'd have seven when she died, she only had a $5 million exemption, and she'd have a $2 million taxable estate, the current rate's 40%. So, you know, that's a fair amount of change. And so by giving, being able to transfer this uh, exemption, which is the portability part of it, uh, it, it seems that as if if we did that, estate planning would be really simple uh, between spouses. If you're under 10 million, just leave everything to the, to the spouse and the spouse would get the exemption mm -hmm. and they'd be able to, to just uh, deal with it uh, moving forward. And there is some truth in that, but there's also some downsides uh, on how to do that. What I mentioned to before, how we, we structure that under the old system before we had portability, we would, uh, if we had to use my, my math number because it's easy, if we had a $7 million taxable estate in California, I'd own three and a half and my wife would own three and a half. And sh her three and a half, she, she, she owns. We'd put my three and a half in a bypass trust, we'd call it. Mean, means it would bypass estate tax on the second spouse's death. So when my spouse died, she'd have three and a half million. There'd be three and a half million in the bypass trust, no tax. So 
but how can we bypass the bypass trust? <laughs> uh, and that's what you know portability is all about, is the ability to bypass having to do anything other than just leave it all to the surviving spouse. And that's simple for tax purposes, uh, but what I'll call planning, real planning, that may not be where you want to go. Uh, and that is because uh, this may not be my first spouse, it may be my second spouse, and this second spouse also may not be the mother of my children. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there could be a problem where if I left everything to my surviving spouse plus my exemption, I've solved my tax problems, but that means my when I die, my surviving spouse gets it all, and she leaves it all to her new husband or leaves it all to some charity that I would object to. And so I have lost control mm -hmm. uh, of those assets. So even though tax-wise it's easy, um, creating that trust for the surviving spouse is, is another matter. Uh, and making sure you can give her the use of it, you can do all sorts of things, but you may want to control the usage and make sure whatever's left gets to the children later on. So I'm not, you know, you just can't say this is the only way to do it because mm -hmm. we've got real planning issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some other uh, aspects of it too, uh, other than just the fact that I make sure it, it gets to where I want it to go. It also provides creditor protection. Mm -hmm. So if I create a trust and have my surviving spouse be the beneficiary of it, that's an exempt asset. The creditors can't get to it. It yeah. protects the spouse. Also, if I create this trust, I not only can have my spouse be a beneficiary, I can also have my children be permitted or permissible beneficiaries under standard. So I can you know, have a broader swath. And so I can make sure that the spouse maybe is the primary beneficiary, but my kids can be a secondary beneficiary. I could even have it bypass the kids and have it go to a charity after that if I wanted to. So I've got a lot of other things I want to think about in terms of the actual planning part of it. So just knee-jerk, boom, give it to the spouse. It's, you know, uh, that's not necessarily the best way to go. Uh, but I'll also be honest with you, in uh, an awful lot of our estate planning that we're doing these days, discussing what I just, dis what I just went through, mm -hmm. at the end of the discussion, the clients look at me and say, that's fine, we want the spouse to get it all. Uh -huh. Okay, and that's that's a perfectly acceptable uh, response and approach. Just as long as they understand what they're doing, so right, that's part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's sometimes, well, especially again when you're dealing with smaller amounts. I mean, frankly, having a trust is a hassle. It's a it's a if it's if it's a smaller estate, you're probably yeah. not going to bother with yeah. it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's some other things to think about uh, related to this bypass trust. So. It, you know, uh, why are, what are some other reasons why you think maybe it's not obsolete? Some other things to think about uh, why you may want to have at least some sort of a trust uh, built into uh, well, an estate plan. Well, as I mentioned, it, it provides some level of protection, right. both for the surviving spouse from him or herself and for the kids, uh, and if there is charitable beneficiaries out there, uh, you know. So there are still uh, reasons to do it. The, another really good reason to do it too, and once again it's tax, tax uh, motivated, is, is that if you create a bypass trust, uh, the, the trust is forever exempt from federal estate tax. So if, if you put in the bypass trust assets that have a huge potential for appreciation, yeah. uh, those appreciated assets are also going to pass out uh, estate tax free. So if you get, you know, my crystal ball is really fuzzy, but if you get one of those really good crystal uh -huh. balls, you say, okay, I'm going to put, uh, you know, somebody a few years ago, you know, putting a, a million Apple shares in it uh, yeah. when it was trading in the teens. Yes. You know, that would have been a, you know, uh, that would have been a nice thing to do because it's obviously gone up considerably in value. Right. So, uh, and sometimes clients know these things. They know things that are going to really appreciate in value. Uh, they might have the you know the right piece of real estate that's in the right path of development that's going to have a huge uh, upside potential. So you can also uh, have a a significant uh, asset pass estate tax free that could be vastly exceed in value the exemption. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another reason to do it too. Right. And now and revocable trusts. I mean, they still will serve a purpose. Well, that's true. The 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 basic revocable trust. Its primary purpose is to avoid probate. Mm -hmm. 
Right. That's that's what it was originally designed to do. And then on top of it, it allows you to do tax planning. Uh, so, so the revocable trust keeps you out of probate. On the first death, the second death, gives you flexibility and allows you to do the tax planning. So in terms of our basic way of doing planning these days uh, is we do revocable trust. In fact, I had some clients recently asked ask me to do it all by way of a will uh, instead of a trust, and I actually told them I wouldn't do it. Oh. <laughs> I can do it. I'm physically, we have the ability yeah. to do it. But I just said, no, I think you need to do a revocable trust, and if your reasons for not doing it make no sense. So I, I, And they came around. Yeah. They finally agreed with me that, yes, uh, they had a they had a misunderstanding of it, uh, but when I explained it to them and they got it, we went forward and did a yeah. uh, revocable trust. So, okay. Uh, okay. Well, what's required to in order to have this portability apply? Well, it's uh, you know it's it's there. It's 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 automatic. So even if you had no estate plan uh, and you died and it was all community property, your surviving spouse would get it all. Uh, the trick is you have to claim the portability on a timely filed federal estate tax return. Right. And uh, when this first started to happen, uh, the temporary regs were saying you have to file a full federal estate tax return, which is a big, complex tax return with lots of information mm -hmm. on it. And that and you have to, you had to elect uh, this this portability. And the IRS has since issued regulations that have said, yes, you still have to do all that, uh, but you don't have to be quite as thorough as you might be on some other things in terms of uh, full valuations of everything so that you, it's a little bit easier than a regular 706. One of the things that we were hoping for was what we, used to, we called a, a, a Form 706-EZ, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which would have been a, a really simplified one. Uh, that unfortunately has not uh, happened. So you do have to file a federal estate tax return. And if you don't file it, you lose it. Yeah. And it's not, uh, and this is the other, that's the other component of it is that some people say, well, gee, I, it's just there. Well, true, it's just there. But you do have to go through this, this tax return, tax filing and reporting to claim it. Uh, it's not completely automatic. Maybe someday it will be, but at the moment uh, it is not. Uh, and you, you are relieved from the, the full-fledged federal estate tax return, but it's still a, it's still a multi-thousand dollar cost return to have the client, to, you know, the client's going to have to pay for it. Right. Now, there are a couple of other things. So one is that um, in order for the person to have their unused exemption go to a surviving spouse, mm -hmm. they have to have passed away after 2010. Correct. Yeah, the, the rules for 2010 are different. Mm -hmm. um, and you know anything it's 2010 after it applies mm -hmm. so and then um you act now you're required also to have a computation of what the exemption amount is on correct the, on so the tax return. yeah so you have to figure out you know uh how much it is you know three thousand or th could be three thousand would be too small but three million four million whatever it is you have to uh, uh, disclose what it is and then it now belongs that exemption now belongs to the survivor. Okay. And then there was one other thing, and that is because it, we were very hopeful when we saw a lot of these things, oh, we don't have to do all this evaluation. But they also say if you've got a formula that's involved in this thing uh, where we need to know the values, then you have to do a full blown tax return. Correct. And so an awful lot of uh, wills and trusts have these formulas that are in them. That's true. If you're dealing with any kind of you know, sort of normal estate planning documents over the last umpteen years, you have formulas. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to require, you know, because you're going to formalize the gift, you have to have uh, the full, full-blown full information in the, in the federal estate tax return. So, okay. so, it, so the next question is, is, okay, well, we just talked about how expensive this is. And, you know, folks, I've done some of these 706s. They're like three, four inches thick, you know, a lot of them. Uh, and so... <laughs> Why bother to do this if there isn't that much property? Well, you know, if the total estate of both spouses is under five million, it'll never be over five million. You could probably just ignore the problem and not file the return. But if you if you if you don't, you lose it. And then you also, you know, you don't know what the future holds. I mentioned, yeah. I don't, you know, there's the possible lotto winning, or there's <laughs> the, uh, maybe you know the, the the stock increase that no one anticipates. 
a, a, a significant inheritance that comes in, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden your estate has gotten bigger mm -hmm. than than you thought it might be, you kind of might want to have this extra five million bucks in your pocket. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's it's going to be a, a, an interesting situation. Obviously, we haven't had to deal with it directly yet. I mean, we've we've every well, I'm trying to think, we have filed a number of federal estate tax returns in the last two years claiming the DeSuya credit, but all of them made sense. I haven't had the one where, gee, you know, it's small enough and it, it's the big if, mm -hmm. you know, do I do it just to protect, uh, you know, protect the exemption. Mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't happened yet. But, uh, and if, you, if you're if you an attorney or a CPA and a client comes in with that kind of problem and they elect not to do it, well, you better make darn sure you've got some acknowledgement that you've explained it to them and they moved on without doing it on purpose, right. knowing the, the there is possible another th consequences. There is another thing. What if you get lucky and you marry somebody that's, you know, you remarry and you marry somebody that's got a ton of money? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Suddenly, this is important. <laughs> well, that's true. If you, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing mm -hmm. because if, you, uh, if you're a pauper and marry a wealthy person, you could possibly uh, you know, get, a, get an ad additional uh, exemption. But usually it's the, it's the wealthy person that wants to have a series of, mm -hmm. of you know, paupered <laughs> spouses who pass on uh -huh. so they can add up all these, uh, oh, goody. <laughs> uh, these various exemptions. It's the, it's the ultimate black widow or widower concept. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So maybe we should get into that then. What if an individual had more than one spouse that predeceased him or her? Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Well, if if they do and they and they have the uh, exemption, they have an additional exemption. They can use that exemption uh, on death. Uh, they can also use it for gifting purposes. Mm -hmm. And if they use it for gifting purposes, they can pile on. Yeah, <laughs> they can have. You know, it's like that spouse is dead. They use it for gifting. Now they get another spouse uh, with no with little or no assets. You can. Use that for gifting, but you can only use it. You can only use yours and your immediately deceased spouses at death. Uh -huh. So, uh, but I don't. This is all new. I don't know of anybody that's that's done this. No. It's one. No. Of, it's one of these theoretical <laughs> things that you we'll can let your mind fly. Yeah. I, I was thinking about you know because because I know you're such a movie fan, and it's like. This this could be a great plot for a movie, you know. <laughs> you can... Oh, absolutely. The problem is that they probably have to spend an hour in the movie explaining this concept before anybody would catch on. It's a little uh, uh, it's a little complex, but uh... so let's talk a little bit about ordering. Um, so, what exclusion is used first? Do you is it like if I make a gift, mm -hmm. does it count against my exclusion first, or if I had a predeceased spouse, do I use her ex exclusion first? I believe it's, if I remember correctly, it's you use the, uh, you use the spouses yeah. first, spouses first, and then on to yours. So you yeah. use up the, the uh, you use up the Desuya first, anything that's come over, the unused exemption amount used first, and then you uh, get to your own exemption second. So, so again, so let's just, just define the Desuya for a moment because we're, we're oh, throwing sorry. this out now. Yeah, it's, it's Desuya, which is a terrible acronym. D S U E A stands for Des. Deceased spouse's unused exemption amount. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's yeah. another acronym that's been thrown into our vocabulary. Okay. Um, but that's what we're talking about. It's the, it's the portability. It's the exempt amount that you can use. Okay. But, but what we did say, though, is now if uh, you remarry mm -hmm. after a death, that spouse, you can use their gift tax exemption uh, you know, of the pre predeceased spouse mm -hmm. uh, yeah. during that while you're married to them. Mm -hmm. And then if they move on or pass away or whatever, mm -hmm. now, you, now you're on to the next one. But, but basically you get to add the gifts onto the total accumulated amount for which you use the, this exemption before. Correct. You can, you can yeah. pile up on the gifts. You can't pile up on the estate. Okay. So, yeah, it's I, well as I said, I, you, you could also imagine this. Somebody might take a look at this and say, "Gee, this isn't what we intended. You're only going to get." They could easily change it to one. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so, anyway, so folks, you can see this is it, the concept is pretty simple, but when we, we're applying it, it actually becomes fairly complex. Um, 
but it's important, again, for very high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. And for people who aren't so high net worth individuals, suddenly it's like you've got a dowry. Something that you can bring to the marriage <laughs> yeah, uh, if you have a predeceased spouse. That, if, yeah, if you yeah, yeah, if you have a, if your yeah, your your spouse might like the fact that they can get get their hands on your exemption. <laughs> oh so, boy! <laughs> no, it's a funny. Uh, it, it's going to as it plays out. It, it's going to be interesting. You know, in the two years we've had it, we've had it for two years. We haven't seen any gamesmanship in it. Uh -huh. uh, it's been pretty straightforward. But well, it's pretty new. But like I said, give it a little time, and I'm sure we're going to have this novel eventually. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what about, what is a qualified domestic trust? Why is it important related to portability? How, how is it maybe a little different? Okay. Well, I'm going to back up a, a oh, okay. second and okay. talk. I want to talk a little bit about uh, qualified domestic trusts in and of themselves, or QDOTs oh, okay. as we call them. Another sure. Acronym. Yeah, you can explain it a little bit. Uh, because this this is really common in our in our valley, and this is... If, if you're a non-U.S. citizen, yes, you are not eligible, your, or pardon me, if your spouse is a non-U.S. citizen, your spouse is not eligible for the unlimited marital deduction. So even though they're a resident of the United States. Even a green card holder. Yes. Doesn't work. They have to be uh, an actual citizen. Uh, otherwise, if you can't give them anything and have it be eligible for the marital deduction, it's going to be su possibly subject to a state tax. And the solution to that is this thing called this QDOT, which is a species of marital deduction trust. And uh, the, the, tr the key part of it is, is that you have to have a U.S. citizen trustee. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's, a, if, it's, if it's really big, you might even have to have a, a bank as a co-trustee in, in, involved in it. So, and that, the idea is, is that trustee will hold the property and the surviving spouse can't take the property back to his or her home country and thereby avoid uh, U.S. tax because it'll always be U.S. venued somehow or other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the different, and you know, uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of um, non-U.S. citizen, I have a lot of non-U.S. citizen clients they, from all yeah. over the world. Yes. And, and what I always like to complain about is what I call the sneaky Canadians. <laughs> if you don't realize, you know, sometimes it's obvious that you have to ask that question, but not always with the Canadians. Um, but it is an important aspect of what we do. And if they be, and the good news is if they become a U.S. citizen, then the, this special trust can self-destruct. But in any event, if you're dealing with it in this context with, with the Dasuya, you don't really know what the Dasuya is because normally if it's a regular marital deduction trust, it gets taxed in the in the estate of the surviving spouse, and so we know what it is, what the tax issues are on the first spouse's death. But a QDOT's weird in that the the tax is really paid in the, out of the QDOT, mm -hmm. and so it's taxable to the first spouse that dies, and so you don't know what the tax is. It may be nothing, mm -hmm. and it could be a lot, and so the uh, as a result, you, know, you can't use uh, Desuya for gifting. You can only use it at death mm -hmm. because you don't know what it is. Right. Until you get to death, so it is a it is a different animal uh, that needs to be be looked at. But you know, non uh, non citizen spouses uh, that are residents of U.S. anywhere, green card holders, whatever, uh, they need to get to you know get sophisticated planning done because they have different tax problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's other even more difficult tax problems if they have overseas assets. And especially if those overseas assets are held in any species of trust. Now we've got now you got special major, reporting requirements. Now you've yeah. got major problems. Yeah. Um, and it need to be, uh, uh, they can be sorted out, but you need to get to a specialist who can sort all that out. Right. So this is just, this is just the Desuya application of it, which is a, a strange result. Yeah. Uh, so if you think about it in the, in the context of you know, our, our international community, especially uh, in our area, um, yeah. You need to get this this adjusted and looked yeah. at. Now there is another thing uh, that, um, again, for some people we may need to adjust our thinking a little bit, or at least have flexibility in our trust documents, and that is because of this big exemption again, uh, the five million. Uh, you know, maybe the Q dot uh, won't be needed. Correct. You don't need to use the Q dot unless you go over five million. Yeah. Because you you still have the exemption, because you can create a trust and have it within the exempt amount, and you're okay. Right. And uh, so, yeah, you just this is, just all depends on 
uh, on values. But if you are a, a, a green card holder or a resident, you're taxed, U.S. taxes you worldwide. So you, if you've got money you know, back in Taiwan or India or wherever, uh, it's all countable. Oh, yeah. uh, and so it, it's, it's tricky. And the, uh, the foreign taxing systems in other countries is usually, some places it's non-existent, but if it does exist, it's usually completely different than ours. Yeah. Even though there are treaties that will allow them to adjust, uh, you have to be very careful on how you do it all. Yeah. So international estate planning is extremely complex. It's like, it's like the brain surgery, I guess, of, of estate no, it's, planning it's, in a sense. It's and very so, complex. Yeah. Uh, and so it's important. You know, uh, what it means in many cases is we need to get the attorneys from the U.S. together with the attorneys mm -hmm. possibly in the other country uh, so they can sort of compare notes and try to figure out how to put this thing together. Well, interestingly, I have found attorneys, local attorneys, that have, are specialized usually by country. Mm -hmm. I found a fellow in San Francisco that's a specialist in Canadian U.S. tax issues. Okay. I found another person who's a specialist in Indian and U.S., and I've got another one with Taiwan. So there, there are people out there that can help, but it is... And they'll know the treaties and how it works. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I just finished doing a bunch uh, uh, with German uh, German citizens and residents. Mm -hmm. So it's. Uh, mm -hmm. But I got somebody in who was once again. Yeah. Who who knew that who knew that okay. very well on top of it. Well, Jim, we're about out of time. So I want to thank you so much for oh, being my guest. You're quite welcome. Quite and welcome. Uh, folks, I think you can appreciate. Again, this is a new area. Portability has just been around. Uh, for a couple of years and now it's permanent so it's important for us to at least be aware uh, of what it is. Like I said, even for you people that are under the five million, you may have a dowry that you didn't even know about. So with that, we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.